everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where it is that you're joining us from. I'm Catherine DeRose, and on behalf of the Viz for DH Organizing Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth workshop on visualization for the digital humanities at uh, Viz 2020. For the next few minutes, I'm going to give a quick overview of how the workshop came together with some acknowledgments. Then I'll move on to highlighting some of what we have to look forward to from this year's program, after which I'll turn things over for our first keynote presentation. As in years past, vis for dh is the result of a committed and collaborative team of international researchers working at the intersections of Viz and DH. You'll see some of my fellow organizers later on as they chair panels, but everyone listed here deserves a very big virtual thank you uh, for all of the work that they put in over the past year. And of course, this is not work that happened in isolation. We also had a really stellar program committee uh, that reviewed submissions and provided feedback on a very short turnaround. So many thanks to our readers. We also want to thank all of the speakers for today who are gonna be sharing their work and ideas. Thank you to the marvelous IEEE Viz tech team who are working behind the scenes to ensure everything runs smoothly, which uh, those of us who are teaching right now on Zoom know is no small feat. And thank you to all of you who are joining us today virtually. Um, it is hope, we hope this promises to be a very generative discussion that we plan to continue to build on at next year's Viz for DH. Each year, Viz for DH has been organized around a theme geared towards exposing and examining the underlying assumptions that we have in our methods and our fields with the broader goal of promoting collaboration between Viz and DH communities. This year's data-oriented theme is no different. On the call for papers, these are some of the questions that we asked presenters to engage. What counts as data in humanities visualizations and who decides? What methods can we explore for constructing, collecting, and or analyzing data at the intersection of visualization and the digital humanities? What gets lost and are constructed when transforming data? And how can we make these constructions or transformations visible? How can we maintain a focus on the particular while also enabling higher level views? How can we reimagine an engagement with data through visualization that embraces an inclusive transdisciplinary perspective? To take up these questions and more, we have a diverse lineup of speakers and session types, uh, which you can see on the screen now, but you can also find the papers and abstracts for the talks on the Viz for DH website. To highlight a few of these in broad strokes, we have two invited talks today. Our opening keynote, Marianne Durek, will look at how philosophical concepts can provide powerful thinking aids for overcoming longstanding dichotomies in biz, and will call for the development of more visualization philosophies. Continuing the conversation, our capstone presentation by Lauren Klein and Catherine D'Ignazio will start the second half of our program and will show how feminist thinking can be operationalized into more ethical data practices. Interspersed in the program, we have two paper sessions where we'll hear talks that range in methods and data types, from literary text and sheet music to historic photographic collections. Our provocation sessions are new to the Viz for DH program this year. These will consist of um, pithy opening statements in response to the question, what is the most undervalued or misunderstood issues surrounding the use of the term data in visualization and digital humanities collaborations? What follows will be, we hope, a robust discussion of ideas around the construction, visualization, and representativeness of data. For our final content block, um, we have laptops, which are also new to the program this year. These will be three minute presentations in which speakers will showcase a component of their lab, whether it be the team makeup to the research questions that they explore. We hope the addition of lab talks will highlight different models of collaboration and will also provide more opportunities for people to connect. On the Viz for DH website, we've added a page to keep a running list of labs or working groups working at the intersections of Viz and DH. If you would like your lab listed on that page, head over to vizfordh.org and click on the lab talks tab to add your group. This is a page that we're planning to continue to expand over the years. Since the lab talks will occur just before a break and the close of the day, there won't be a Q&A after them. Instead, you can reach out directly to presenters over one of our many communication channels for this workshop. 
Uh, these include Discord, YouTube, and Twitter. Please feel free to engage on whatever platform you're most comfortable with. For those new to Discord, you can upvote questions by clicking on the question mark icon or the thumbs up icon. Questions that are answered will get a check mark next to them. Questions from all platforms will be relayed to speakers by the session share. During breaks, we're encouraging you to try out Gather Town, which is a virtual space where you can walk around and have a video chat with people who are in the same vicinity as your avatar. I like to think of it as Zoom meets Legend of Zelda for Super Nintendo. So if that helps you picture what Gather Town uh, may be like, I encourage you to try it out. Gather Town does cap us at 25 participants, but if it winds up being popular, uh, we'll open up additional rooms and we'll post the link to those on Discord and YouTube. But with that, I'm going to turn things over to Florian, who will introduce our first keynote. Of the organizational committee, it's my pleasure to set up the first keynote of this year's workshop, which will be given by Marianne Dirk. If you are regular in the vis 40 h field, or especially in the vis 4 ch field, as in visualization for cultural heritage, there's a fair chance that you have met him already or enjoyed interacting with at least one of the numerous prototypes or papers which he frequently contributes to the field. Nevertheless, to rise to the occasion of a short introduction, let me just mention a couple of points for our orientation. After graduating in computer science at University of Magdeburg, Marian did his PhD at University of Calgary with Sheila Carpendale, which you can also see as the closing capstone of the IEEE VIS conference. Uh, he did a short research uh, associateship at Newcastle University and then took on a research professorship at the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam. There he co-founded the Urban Complexity Lab and since then he's pushing out amazing work together with collaborators and students in the area of uh, collection visualization and other topics into which he'll introduce you in a second. As for redefining and rethinking data, I think it's fair to say that his 2011 paper on the information flaneur alone counts among the prime examples and essential lenses, how to question established notions and perspectives on the data deluge of our days. But there are numerous other papers which have a similar impulse and effect, including work on critical perspectives and the politics of visualization, which will resonate nicely with our second keynote of today. Marianne co-organizes the Information Plus conference since 2018 which facilitates exchange between scholars, designers, and practitioners of visualization. And we'll also do next year, to which uh, the conference was shifted, since this year proved to be not the most easy one for event organizers around the globe. To wrap up this introduction with a short anecdote, uh, when I talked to Bruno Latour recently, suggesting to bring a rather complex visualization to one of his exhibitions, he listened politely and nodded his head and finally recommended, I guess, to help clear my ideas and to get the ducks in a row that uh, I maybe should consider first to get in touch with a certain visualization professor from uh, FH Potsdam, who he thought was already doing relevant work in between Benjamin's Flaneurs, Leibnizian Monats and Deleuzean Folds. And to be honest with you, from the viewpoint of an ex-philosophy student and from a vis for the H or H for vis perspective, that's as cool a redirect as it gets. So Marianne, thanks for being with us, with us today. To minimize connectivity risks, you have sent us a pre-recorded video for your keynote from the flaneur to the fold, imbuing data visualization with philosophy. So the screen is yours, and I'd kindly ask the tech team to start the presentation. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I feel very honored and privileged to give this presentation at such an odd and yeah interesting time. This talk comes in five parts. I'll start with introductory remarks about criticality in data visualization. Then in three steps, I try to demonstrate the value of philosophy for visualization design and research. And at the end, I will 
try to conclude in time with promises, pitfalls, and a plea. The premise of this talk is that visualizations are particular articulations of data. That is, they say something, they speak to issues, and they make statements. When we consider a visualization in this way, we can ask who is speaking and also from which position. Um, as articulations, data visualizations can have descriptive and argumentative functions. They describe what is and or might also argue what should be. And over the course of a visualization's lifetime, especially during collaborative projects, maybe with humanities scholars, the roles shift from exploration to communication and actually most likely will oscillate between these. Yet even before a visualization is actually being used, uh, there are already crucial assumptions at play about the holy trinity of data viz, users, data, and tasks. These words are already saying a lot about the basic assumptions of our field, and we can rethink, redefine, and reimagine them. Thankfully, this is already underway. These terms are being decentered to give way to more nuanced notions of the who, what, and how of our field. We know by now that seemingly gender neutral terms such as users are actually not understood as such. Instead, they are largely read and imagined as male by both women and men. So we need to find a language that actually strives for inclusion. For example, the study by Adam Bradley and colleagues indicated that persons, for example, and participants were less often implicitly understood as male. When it comes to notions of data, uh, we already have uh, the emergence of critical data studies as an entirely new field. Uh, and maybe briefly here, I'd just like to uh, mention Johanna's, Johanna Drucker's proposal to reconceptualize data as capta, uh, data as being actually taken in contrast to be given, in order to refer to the intentions and decisions involved in generating or collecting data. And while there are numerous task taxonomies in visualization, there's a growing interest in activities and practices that we may want to pay attention to, in particular in the context of teaching and knowledge acquisition, as for example, the VIS activities workshop we'll explore tomorrow. Now, just to be clear, this is not hair splitting, but about terminological plurality. By reconsidering some basic terms, we can ask new questions about visualization, such as who not, what for, how about, under which conditions, and also for which purpose. These kinds of questions open up critical perspectives on the basic tenets of visualization. And critical here refers simply yet fundamentally to the question, why is it like this? And not like that. Why is it not otherwise? And more, Elaborately, a critical approach to visualization actually challenges the taken for grantedness of the underlying assumptions and actual de decisions. A few years ago, my colleagues at the time at the University of Calgary, Patrick Fang, Christopher Collins, and Sheila Carpendale, and I noticed the proliferation of data visualization across various sectors and settings. We also noticed actually a lack of critical perspectives on data visualization. So we wondered what a critical approach to visualization could possibly look like that would help us to come to grips with the politics embedded into data visualization. Based on critical theories of knowledge, pedagogy, and geography, we tentatively formulated a critical approach to information visualization that proposed four basic commitments that visualization designers should aspire to. Disclosure is about making a visualization more transparent by revealing data sources, intentions, and decisions. Plurality is based on the premise that there's no visualization that captures all aspects of an issue. If we accept that, then the principle of plurality encourages the designer to include a variety of perspectives with special consideration of the people affected by a topic and those who are systematically excluded. Contingency is about the variety of experiences that a visualization allows for. Is the visualization highly prescriptive or does it invite a range of interpretation? A vis designed for contingency would be sensitive to the changing nature of the represented phenomenon, as well as the particular situation of the viewer. In this sense, it would allow viewers to have unique experiences and insights with the visualization. 
And the fourth principle, empowerment, captures the dual aspiration of empowering visualization designers and viewers. On the one hand, designers should be able to let their voice be heard and perspective on an issue be seen. On the other hand, viewers should be enabled to question the representations, utilize them to tell their own story and shift from awareness to action. These principles are not meant as the complete criteria for judging a given visualization, good or bad, but they were an attempt to devise a questioning lens on what we called engaging data visualizations. Now, looking back, I still find these useful to examine existing visualizations, but they may not be that effective to generate new ideas for innovative visualization techniques. And um, when we consider actually the recent proliferation of data vis across various sectors and disciplines, there's still a need for critical perspectives to come to grips with the ethical and epistemological implications of data vis. And thankfully, over the last few years, we have seen a growing body of exciting work that thoroughly engages with cultural, political, and ethical aspects of our field. In his book, All Data Are Local, Yanni Lukisas traces the local specificity of data practices and demonstrates how understanding the data setting is crucial for understanding data in the first place. He also highlights the impact of recontextualization of data through digital interfaces such as data visualization. With data feminism, Catherine Ignacio and Lauren Klein demonstrate the import of humanist thought such as intersectional feminism in data science and visualization. And I'm really excited to hear the talk later today. It is feminist theory and methods that Catherine and Lauren are invoking to develop fundamental principles that address questions of power and exclusion in data science and visualization. And the book Data Visualization in Society, edited by Martin Engelbretson and Helen Kennedy, offers a rich and comprehensive set of sociological and semiotic research on data visualization practices, principles, and pedagogies. So last year, this workshop actually ended with a plea to humanize visualization. And I would say this is already in full swing. At a time when the IEEE VIS community is turning 30 years old, we witness the emergence of a kind of humanities of and for visualization. We might call this critical infovis, interpretivist visualization, or the dawn of a visualization philosophy. Either way, I'm convinced that this humanist wave of visualization research is not optional icing on the cake, but necessary and overdue. This is not only instructive, but also very much generative. And this is what this talk is about. How can critique drive creation and vice versa? What if we would treat visualization as seriously as the big question about life, the universe, and everything. In order to do this, not just as a solitary or socially distanced exercise on a Sunday, we need to find ways to pursue these speculations and enter into productive collaborations. So Michael Carell talked last year about a power imbalance that can occur when we apply visualization to humanity's work without actually meeting on an equal footing. I agree with his argument against such a service orientation, but I want to emphasize that there are various types of collaborations between visualization and various fields of the humanities. And this workshop is actually a testament to a spectrum of collaborative engagements. So instead of the service orientation, I actually fully subscribe to the notion of sandcastles as proposed by Uta Hinrichs and colleagues to describe cross-disciplinary and collaborative knowledge generation in which during which visualizations act as provocations, speculations, and mediations. And what I really like about sandcastling is the inviting and open gesture. So let's build sandcastles together. I would now like to talk about three research projects that did not start from a place of service, but rather at the proverbial beach, as speculations about data visualization. Drawing from humanistic thinking, we ask simple but fundamental what-if questions about the basic principles of our field. First, what if we reconsider bureaucratic notions of users through the lens of a poetic persona? This is work I've done together with my PhD advisors Sheila Carpendale and Carrie Williamson at the University of Calgary. The aim was to imagine novel visualizations and interfaces that play towards positive attitudes and not deficiencies. And to do this, we turn to Paris, where the literary figure of the flaneur roams the boulevards, arcades, and cafes. 
This is at a time when cities were starting to grow rapidly and industrialization was really picking up steam. Discussed, this, this, this figure was discussed in cultural studies either as someone who's casual or leisurely interested in the city uh, and other scholars actually saw the more critical and subversive uh, facets of this persona. For the purpose of these, this research, we took an inclusive understanding. We considered the flaneur to be someone who is very much interested in what the city has to offer, but not in terms of the commercial spectacle or not only, but rather in terms of the sensations and uh, different kind of perspectives that one could gain in the city. That, um, this per personal pace and perspective that the flaneur has uh, also allows him uh, to actually reflect um, on his own critical attitude. Uh, so as a flaneur, he's actually torn between the fascination by the urban spectacle and the repulsion concerning the social realities that appear to come with modern progress. And as part of this grappling with these tensions, the flaneur sees the city as an epic story that calls for creative interpretation. Trying to make the urban landscape meaningful, the flaneur dismantles present realities, reassembles them and imagines alternative possibilities. Now, what has this to do with actually data or visualization, you may ask? Well, everything. The flaneur arose in the growing city of the 19th century, which in fact has many things in common with today's digital information spaces. Growing size, significance and struggles. And so just quite similar actually to uh, the role that data and social media and digital information spaces play today uh, as cultural backdrops for pretty much everything that we do. So the flaneur is an inspiring human-centered analogy for information seekers. With his curious, critical and creative approach to the city, the flaneur provides a refreshing, refreshing lens to rethink our notion of users. With the flaneur as a lens, we can imagine and examine actually uh, human-centered research on information seeking and visualization and conceptualize the information flaneur as a new model that promotes a shift away from the deficiencies and work-centered artifacts to more positive traits, activities and experiences. And informed by this interdisciplinary research and inspired by uh, the mindset of the urban flaneur, we proposed the information flaneur uh, to be a positive persona for information seeking and data visualization. The information flaneur may not represent all people or practices, however, we draw on ample evidence for these kinds of attitudes and activities. And in order to better support these practices, we try to translate the poetic persona to the design of interactive visualizations and interfaces. We proposed for that an interaction schema that spans action, perception, and affect. And the general idea here is that information seekers tend to shift actually between high level and low level activities that can be understood along these three experiential dimensions. Now, considering horizontal exploration and vertical immersion, we face the challenge to bring together abstract and detailed representations of information spaces. And this challenge has actually triggered a whole series of projects and collaborations, especially in the context of digital cultural heritage. And I would like to show briefly one project, which has now become the Vigos Viewer, a visualization that was specifically designed for cultural collections. It was created by Christopher Peach, Katrin Glinka, and myself, and the interface basically places thousands of drawings made by Frederick William IV throughout his lifetime along a timeline, a zoomable timeline as you see. Uh, the images can be filtered along tags and the entire space can be yeah, zoomed and panned and as you zoom in you get really high detailed imagery uh, of the drawings that um, this uh, Prussian ruler uh, has uh, created uh, during his life. Now I'm going to keep this very short here. I encourage you to, to play with it. We have actually expanded this, this tool, this visualization, with uh, further layouts and also worked with other collections. Um, but um, just to, to um, emphasize this, the idea of the horizontal and vertical approach um, and the idea uh, of actually supporting um, uh, an information flaneur attitude towards this, uh, this collection has been a central uh, uh, motivation and a central conceptual basis um, for um, yeah, collection visualizations such as the Vicus Viewer here. Okay, so the second sandcastle gets started at Newcastle University in the UK in collaboration with Rob Comer and Martin Date Robertson. 
and uh, we asked what happens if we do away with the distinction between overview and detail. Um, we took the growing prevalence of networks as a starting point to question this basic distinction in visualization. Uh, as you know, whenever we engage with relational information spaces, we tend to operate at two distinct levels, micro and macro. Either we take a close look at an individual node or we see a broad overview of an entire network. This dichotomy is reflected by the available interfaces for relational information spaces. Profile pages focus on individual elements with only hints at their social embeddedness, while network visualizations show everything at once, often reducing the rich relationships among elements to a hairball of overlapping lines. And uh, for this research, we wanted to explore the space between part and whole to generate new ideas for the design of visual interfaces um, that let us access and explore rich relational collections where details of elements are integrated into, view, into one view of the collection. To do this, we are considering the philosophical concept of monads. In a paper in the British Journal of Sociology, Bruno Latour and colleagues defined the concept of monads in the following way. A point of view on all the entities taken severally and not as a totality. <clears throat> now, uh, in that article, they actually refer back to Gabriel Tart, a French sociologist who actually wrote an entire book on monads. In this book, Tart characterizes the monad in a more active way. Each monad draws the world to itself and thus has a better grasp of itself. Um, the point for us is that the monad is neither whole nor part, but a unique perspective of one particular element on all the other elements of the whole collection. And we were very intrigued by these ideas as they gave us new ways to think not just about actually information representation, but also interactivity. To translate the concept of monads to visualization design, we distilled three basic qualities of Tart's monadology that we found to be very instructive. Having describes the importance of relational aspects in information spaces. For this, we need to find ways to represent the social world of a collection. Difference um, is, about, is about the, uh, the fact that each monad is a unique perspective onto the world. This quality emphasizes an element's distinct position in a collection. And movement highlights the associations among elements that are contingent and dynamic and cannot be statically captured, but require a constant change of position and perspective. Could we support such a navigation between overlapping monads? Now, taken together, we proposed monadic exploration as an open-ended movement along elements which are in turn overlapping perspe perspectives in relation information spaces. There are many ways how the ideas of monadic exploration can be applied to interfaces and visualization design. Um, in the context of the initial project, uh, we demonstrated one attempt, but we were confident that there are many more possibilities. For this, we first set ourselves one general objective. We want to treat elements as vantage and navigation points. And with more specific design goals, we hypothesized, if not imagined, an interface that would offer an elastic arrangement of elements, reveal differences among elements, and integrate search functionality with navigation. In the following, I will briefly go through the key design decisions for our first prototype. First, we opted for a circular layout around which elements are positioned according to a global ordering and interactive uh, query formulations and selections. The active element or search box is displayed in the center and all the other items are placed around it. Those with high relevance or attraction scores are drawn closer to the center and uh, the less relevant elements, they move towards the periphery of the display. The attraction value is based on both direct and indirect links among elements. So even so, here in this example network, even if uh, the nodes B and F may not become BFFs uh, or even neighbors, uh, we can still compute uh, a, a latent attraction force that is based on the paths via shared neighbors and their neighbors. The result is that instead of having a binary adjacency matrix, we can compute an attraction matrix that captures more nuanced differences in the relationships between elements, even if they share no edge. With this, we have everything for position. Uh, and now onto the interaction side. 
The visualization supports, so the, this initial visualization supports three basic operations. You can search, hover, and select. When you search, the elements move towards the center when they are more relevant, when they actually match. All the elements that actually do not match at all are on the very outside. And then you can select elements, and um, the selected elements move into the center. Uh, and whenever you change basically queries or selections, the, um, you, you notice these gradual movements of elements inward or outward, uh, which reflects kind of this movement through this, this relational collection. Now, this was a first attempt, and we were actually relatively happy with the result. Uh, to see how uh, people would actually respond to an interface designed towards monadic exploration, we closely collaborated with the editors behind the book Beautiful Trouble, a toolbox for revolution, which is essentially a recipe book for peaceful and creative forms of activism. We chose this book as a case study because it is a highly cross-referenced collection of information entries, but also because of the passionate interest that editors and readers have for this subject matter. After deploying the visualization for several months, and by now actually for several years, uh, we've received a range of favorable feedback. And uh, I want to quickly highlight two key observations. One editor compared this view to a new type of table of contents that highlights relationships uh, and the actual uh, 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 content, the uh, actual titles and, uh, and some of the teasers are actually included. So that's something he uh, deemed highly useful for the purpose of drawing readers into the book. Um, from visitors, we received mostly positive feedback, even though there were also some confusions among them, but their statements often mixed their interest in the content and thoughts on the interface. So according to this and other feedback submissions, it seemed as if the visualization was resonating with the rich material of the book. Since then, the idea of monadic exploration is actually something we have picked up in multiple projects. I want to highlight one project, uh, actually um, a student research project, uh, in which we have actually applied uh, uh, these ideas to a collection of historic glass negatives from the uh, a museum from the Museum for Art and Design in Hamburg. So here the, uh, the, 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 the designers and developers was a team uh, comprised of uh, Pauline Junginger, Dennis Ostendorf, Barbara Avila Vissirini, Anastasia Voloshina, Timo Hausmann, Sarah Kreisler, and I was mostly on the sidelines. I want to highlight this uh, one here. Uh, I want to highlight this, which is called the close-up cloud, because it offers maybe a surprising take on that complication uh, between overview and detail. Now you already have seen uh, now some steps in here, but basically uh, uh, it, uh, it's um, a, a, an entirely, yeah, I would say different uh, visualization technique uh, as it actually takes the details, as you see here, um, as the starting point for the overall overview on, on an entire collection. So here, as you see right now, the squares actually stand for different iconographic details and the size of these squares corresponds to the frequency across the collection. And as you select one of these uh, uh, squares, you will basically see um, uh, a, a, um, a filtered view for uh, um, this particular tag. Uh, and then you step by step actually get an overview of individual items while the initial overview comprised details. Now, this is Again, uh, um, a, a prototype, a visualization technique, a proposition that uh, really um, uh, doesn't work so well in video. Uh, so I'd suggest you to try it out yourself and, and play around and explore these uh, historic glass negatives. Now, uh, the last and third concept is based on joint work with my colleagues Victoria Brüggemann and Mark-Jan Bludau at the UC lab in Potsdam. For this research, we asked ourselves, what if we would consider encoding and interaction in Unison as inseparable parts of any data visualization? The visual encoding has always been central to visualization teaching, research, and practice. For this, the visual variables are, of course, important building blocks. On the other hand, there has also been considerable research interest in the role of interactivity for engagement, insight, and comprehension, such as uh, the paper Fluid Interaction by Niklas Amquist et al. Uh, uh, demonstrates. Yet when visualizations are designed, uh, most of the time there seems to be much less attention devoted to their interactivity compared to the visual encoding. There seems to be a gap 
in the design process between devising data mappings and integrating inter interactive capabilities, which is typically done as a second step, if not even as an, uh, as an afterthought. Now, uh, while this gap is often bridged through animated transitions, the resulting animations can be visually jarring and may not be that meaningful. So to address this gap, we'd suggest the consideration of the philosophical concept of the fold as a new way of interpreting and creating interactive data visualizations. For our work, we focus on Gilles Deleuze's thoughts on perception and information processing and try to link it to data visualization. So let's unpack this. In the work by Deleuze, we encounter the monads again as a basic building block of the world. Each monad is filled with folds on two levels, the pleats of matter and the folds in the soul which are distinct and still continuously interwoven, not unlike encoding and interaction in visualization. According to Deleuze, the monad already holds all information twisted into many folds. If it was confronted with questions or new information, the folds would begin to twist and turn into, vari into a variety of permutations after which the resulting answer or links to other information can become suddenly visible. The answer was already there, it was only hidden or not yet folded into an intelligible form. For Deleuze, the three operations, explication, implication and complication, form the essential triad of the fold. The first two, they need to be understood as a pair of which one is reversing the other. Explication describes the process of unfolding, such as opening a book while implication, in turn, refers to the commonly known process of folding that reduces something in size and detail, such as closing an open book. These operations draw our attention closely to visibility and presence. If something inside the monad is hidden through the process of implication, what is folded, and, uh, what is folded still comprises everything else, though this is not always perceivable with the human senses. Through the process of explication, hidden connections uh, can become visible again. So this is actually utterly interesting if you think about data visualization. What is shown versus what is hidden or not shown yet. As the third operation of the fault, complication offers an explanation of how sense making works as information accumulation and connection building of everything perceivable while also addressing its arbitrariness and incompleteness. Because everything inside the monad is folded to infinity Every possibility already lies inside of it, yet it cannot expose itself in its entirety at any moment. It's simply way too much to grasp at a given moment. Surprising occurrences are thus complicated folding processes in which connections are rearranged and only part of the connected universe becomes visible. This perpetual incompleteness of any knowledge is what makes this theory so relevant for data visualization. With visualization, we typically aim to explore and communicate complex matters. But when we do this, we also need to make these omissions and reductions uh, uh, that are necessary to actually make something uh, um, yeah, understandable. But we also may have to com com convey actually what we have reduced, what we have omitted, what actually the scope of a given visualization is. And the fold makes a unique proposition about the place of interactivity in this regard, in actually accommodating and dealing with incompleteness. It's an invitation to approach data through interactive visualizations as elastic, coherent, and potentially infinite systems. Instead of focusing on static snapshots of visualizations, which would favor their visual encoding, the fold actually sheds light on the in-between states of folding processes, emphasizing the transitions between display states as meaningful ways that need to be carefully considered and designed. Now, Contrary to techniques that split dimensions into multiple views or enforce abrupt display changes, the fold suggests traceable transitions between successive visualization states, which gradually integrate additional data aspects into the same visualization. Now, as you can tell from my enthusiasm, we see the fold as an opportunity um, to conceptualize visualization in a novel framework that rejects the separation between interactivity and visual encoding. Deleuze's treatment of the fault is rather extensive, if not elusive at times, and uh, therefore I had to actually gloss over many details here. As a little hat trick, I would refer you to our recently published DHQ paper, where you find many more details unfolded 
illustrated and referenced. Um, these ideas of the fold actually found their application and also iteration during a collaboration with the Theodor Fontana archive in Potsdam. The aim of the project was to support the scalable study of the reference library of this German author. The books contain various reading traces in the form of annotations, comments in his own handwriting, scribbles, and so forth. You can actually um, view that collection at various scales. You can uh, yeah, filter it and focus on different subsets. And each transition, each display change is carefully crafted and considered. Uh, and there's also actually a complication mode that we're looking at right now, uh, where the, the various books are placed based on their similarity, not in terms of content, but actually in terms of reading behavior. So it basically uh, offers a really alternative, maybe in a way surprising way of engaging with that data collection. Um, now, before my microphone is being turned off, let me briefly conclude. In the context of digital humanities and cultural heritage research, the power of philosophical concepts have proven to cross disciplinary Wait, boundaries can you give us by a offering sign an evocative as as and inviting ends, because vocabulary. Because we can't see the video um, right now. With these, with these terms, with these, with these uh, concepts, we were able to challenge conventions and also overcome, I would argue, I would propose, um, overcome dichotomies such as overview and detail, and visual encoding and interaction. Uh, furthermore, and maybe most importantly um, for the collaborative uh, nature of our research, um, the, the concepts allowed us to co-develop um, in, in, yeah, together, uh, collaboratively, a, a coherent, coherent frameworks that are not muddied by technical details, but rather uh, aspire to, to a certain shared vision about a project. However, um, imbuing data visualization also comes at a cost and also with risks. Uh, and so there are a few uh, of these that I briefly want to mention. The first one could also be considered a chance. There's the, 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 the chance or the risk of uh, getting lost in a rabbit hole. Uh, as you know, each paper, each book, each theory that you encounter is a portal into an entirely new universe. And uh, when you're not trained in actually uh, reading humanities uh, literature uh, or certain uh, schools of philosophy, you might get well, sidetracked or really uh, pulled deeply in. Um, I don't know, um, this is probably true for any kind of academic discipline, but I would say particularly when we're dealing with philosophy. Now, um, there's a maybe more severe risk uh, or pitfall, which is um, the reduction of rich, intricate uh, philosoph philosophical concepts and turning them into yeah, um, um, simple and mundane design resources, bite-sized uh, catchphrases uh, with which we um, basically motivate or um, yeah, sell uh, uh, um, um, research ideas. And the, uh, and the issue here is that we might disregard actually critical distinctions and nuances uh, and also uh, developments of certain terms. So, for example, the flaneur is, has all kinds of baggage and, and complications with regards to gender, class, and the historical situation, which I entirely glossed over. So these are not just uh, theoretical risks. I think uh, that's some, also something we need to uh, figure out. And last but not least, and also uh, equally important also for what I have uh, presented over the last um, half an hour or so, uh, is the risk of actually uh, remaining stuck in a land of stale, male, and pale philosophers. At a time when we actually need philosophies for the future that represent the full div diversity of humankind. And uh, as I said, we need to connect more with current epist epistemological thinking and writing about life, the universe, and everything. For example, this wonderful collection edited by Anna Tsing and colleagues is a treasure trove of inspiration, especially also for data visualization, I would say. Um, considering the devastating state of the world, uh, I really concur with the editors of this collection that we need to cultivate a form of curiosity that recognizes entanglements, complexity, and the shimmer. And I'm actually really hopeful uh, that however we want to call this, critical, interpretivist, or humanist data visualization has really something uh, valuable and meaningful to contribute here. So I would now 
uh, like to end with a plea. Uh, we need to intertwine visualization research and practice with epistemological advances and academic programs in other disciplines to stay relevant um, or become relevant again. So for this, we need to expand the scope of our consideration in humanist visualization research and practice to also include social and ecological concerns. And we need visualization philosophies that let us envision new worlds, that let us see not just from above, but also from underneath and inside the cracks. Now, before I really end, I briefly send my uh, warmest and special thanks to my wonderful collaborators here listed in order of appearance in this presentation. I also want to sneak in a cheeky wink and wave to uh, a future colleague uh, with experience in 3D and semantic web data. If you are out there, please contact us. Uh, and I look forward to your questions and the exchanges during the workshop, as well as your presentations today. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And now also welcome Marian here live on the stream. We have okay. about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. And for that, I want to encourage everyone to just post their questions to the Discord channel of session one. And as far as I can see, we have at least uh, two questions already online. So maybe I can just read them to you, Marian. The first one would be from Huda Lamkotam which writes, I love the poetic image of the information flaneur, and I'm curious about how we can view it from a data feminist or queer lens. Can we think about what characterizes the behavior of an information flaneuse, just as the constraints, pressures, and risks that affect women or queer folks' movements within physical cities? Can we use this image to conceptualize the needs of oppressed genders within datascapes? Yeah, wonderful and also big question, uh, Huda. Thank you for that. Um, I think first I have to acknowledge, and I've only done this um, briefly at the end, um, is that uh, basically my notion of the flaneur, um, as I've studied it um, basically 10 years ago, uh, was actually really reduced and limited. Um, since then, actually, we have seen more research also and more, more writing on also the flaneurs, flaneurs or the, the woman flaneur. Um, such as Lauren Elkin's uh, book on this. So I think one way of uh, actually addressing is that actually uh, um, yeah, appreciating and somehow accommodating um, different takes on the city, whether it's the historic city or the contemporary city. And um, maybe um, I think more, um, let's say, um, more severely and more problematically, I think, when it comes to actually being out uh, in, in the uh, actual urban city, um, uh, the perspective uh, of non-male um, yeah, strollers or wanderers uh, is uh, definitely, um, um, unfortunately, a very different one, also in terms of security. And uh, so it's, um, so, um, so when I have used the information planner over the last uh, past years, I have always kind of included kind of a, a disclaimer, kind of trying to acknowledge that uh, it's, it's not as innocent as it sounds. However, it does actually start that conversation. And I think for that reason, I still find it actually useful. And um, yeah, maybe um, 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 I think just to, to finish this response to that, uh, um, I think um, we need to basically pull in the, the poetries and perspectives also from um, yeah, other identities and other perspectives and think about how, how we would um, conceive uh, conceptualize uh, visualization and interfaces uh, around yeah on, around these other perspectives as well but there's more to be said and done on that so thank you great thank you um there is a follow-up comment and question um on uh who does um comments um which is um, from H hannah jacobs and she's also asking with uh, regard to a uh, dissonance between information flaneur and critical approaches if uh, plurality, plurality and contingency um, can can actually be fulfilled um, by using the um, information flaneur. Yeah, I think. I mean, it, it basically, I think emphasizes or underlines uh, um, Huda's um, question. So, thank you, Hannah. I th I do think that actually um, um, the the idea of um, 
um, taking a historically cultural specific um, time and place, uh, but expanding basically the, um, the kinds of considerations, not just looking at the privileged man who is able and basically equipped financially and uh, um, and otherwise to actually do that, to actually then think and then expand it and actually think about how uh, other identities would have experienced Paris in the middle of 19th century. That's, that's one thing. And I think the, um, in terms of uh, plurality, um, the, the transfer to cultural heritage and, and, uh, uh, and visualizations of, 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 of collections, um, they basically uh, trigger similar questions. The, um, the historic specificity uh, of, of some of these artifacts and collections is actually often also somewhat problematic. And it's also, and, and I acknowledge this, this is also something that we haven't really accounted for. The Frederick William uh, data set that we originally worked with, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it was a Prussian ruler who uh, was very much against um, some of the democratic uh, uh, um, uprisings, and um, so, um, so I think the, uh, I think the, um, I think the flaneur is not um, in in dis I would say not in dissonance necessarily uh, with plurality and contingency, um, but um, maybe if we actually would expand it to uh, multiple uh, personas and actually spell that out, what it would mean for different kinds of backgrounds and perspectives. Also a really good and difficult question. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Georgia Panagiotidou. And uh, she writes, I really appreciate the interdisciplinary approach to conceptualizing the visualization in coding and interaction designs, drawing from concepts in urban design, philosophy and social sciences. And I wonder how the process goes, deconstructing visualizations or getting immersed in humanistic practices. What are the roles of collaborators? Yeah, great question, Georgia. Thank you. Um, so um, it's it's multifold uh, um, the process. So I think first, um, uh, I think um, the, and I think yes, deconstructing visualizations and being let's say aware or, or having experience in using and maybe also devising visualizations and kind of knowing where um, yeah. Um, where it hurts or what's problematic or where the limitations are um, and in the same time, um, uh, also getting immersed uh, um, in the um, in uh, the humanistic humanistic work, but also the humanistic writing. So um, I think, uh, especially now, we, uh, I think Mark Jan, Victoria, and I were still kind of um, in the in the fold uh, kind of mode here. Uh, at my coffee here, very difficult questions come, but um, having that actually kind of running this in parallel and trying to uh, allow for um, in, like kind of meant intellectually, mentally, to cross these, uh, uh, to have these um, practices cross and think about, okay, uh, especially now when we work with the Fontana archive, um, they were very much aware and we had constant uh, actually exchange around this, hmm, you know, we're reading up on the fold and Deleuze and but on the other hand, the, the um, humanistic literary work um, uh, went, basically went on in in somewhat in parallel to, to our kind of visualization oriented uh, work, both on the design side, as well as the kind of theorizing and philosophizing, if you will. Um, but the, um, the roles of collaborators um, are different in, in different um, 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 projects in different settings. Um, and it's, um, I think it's uh, important to basically be um, um, transparent on your kind of agenda and your interests and your, your needs. Uh, we know, I've mentioned it early in the, in the presentation, we know that um, there's a risk um, uh, of kind of being a bit pigeonholed into the service uh, role as, as visualizers. I think we have um, a certain yeah, asset or um, um, yeah, a, a utility in, the, in, the, in these visualizations. And I think we have to be careful not to, not to only fulfill this role, but also basically um, yeah, do more. And, and so far, we have been really, really lucky with our collaborators um, who are actually keen on how we, for example, uh, read the fold and think about what it could uh, offer for, for visualization design. Great, thank you. Um, Christopher is asking with regard to the project Close Up Cloud, whether the images have been annotated manually. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Christopher. That's a short answer. Um, so the team has actually um, early on in the project um, noticed that it would be really cool to not just um, 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 tag uh, the glass negatives as a whole, as they noticed actually that lots of, of the iconographic uh, uh, tags um, were actually referring to uh, very detailed elements on these objects that are maybe just a, a, a bit more detail on, 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 on that collection. Uh, these glass negatives were actually the first um, yeah, um, photographs being taken for the um, Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe Hamburg. Um, so it was basically very early documentation of, the, of this uh, arts, and, um, arts and design uh, collection. And um, the, uh, so the tags were already there, but they were not located. So we actually um, um, placed them manually. Um, and in that process, and actually that's maybe also uh, going back to Georgia's uh, uh, question, this is actually uh, also relates to uh, the collaboration and how we work together. Um, the ability to actually still change, enrich, uh, um, expand uh, um, a data set, a collection, um, uh, a data set, um, is actually has been very fruitful. That's how we actually worked also with the Fontana archive and also with others so that we actually kind of um, bounce uh, ideas back and forth how uh, actually the how we can reimagine uh, 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 how the data looks so that the visualization doesn't satisfy only how the visualization uh, uh, how the uh, sorry how the data set uh, would have been structured um, initially but that we actually kind of work together on that that has happened also with the close-up cloud but manually so far Great. So right now there are no further questions in the chat, even though some people are still typing. Maybe I can slip in one question, uh, Marianne. Um, I think it's fair to say that you did kind of this for the H or um, H for this before it was a real thing. Um, the information flaneur was, I think, from 2011. So maybe um, this um, allows me to ask how come. Um, would you know about some educational or biographical reasons that you started this kind of hybridization quite early on? Yeah, I think um, it's actually funny because I, I think next door uh, in the, um, I think is it, the, I think the VIS guides uh, workshop, they're talking about pedagogies and, and teaching. So um, I'm really quick with that. So I was um, allowed and also required to take uh, during my PhD to take courses outside of computer science and one of the courses was urban design theory. So I actually learned uh, about this cultural figure of the flaneur. In German actually fla uh, flanieren, the, the verb, um, is actually kind of a common word, uh, but uh, the, this kind of historic cultural figure uh, was not something I was really familiar with. Um, and um, during the PhD program I was required to write like a kind of midway exam, a, ca a candidacy. And I was procrastinating and I thought, hmm, somehow speaking of actually, you know, aligning multiple kind of intellectual uh, activities, I was still uh, kind of um, in the kind of, I still had this urban design theory class in mind. And I was thinking, hmm, this planner figure is actually really intriguing, um, this approach to the city. And I actually wrote like, an, like a digression in my paper. I actually said digression colon the flaneur and um, yeah, um, Gratitude and kudos to Sheila Carpenter, who said, that's not a digression. That's actually key uh, uh, to what we're trying to do here with visualization and information seeking. So um, uh, Sheila and Carrie, they encouraged me and yeah, we worked together on actually um, um, bringing these, these kind of, um, the kind of empiricism, which is also actually included in the, in the original information planner paper, the, the uh, empirical evidence that we have on information seeking and information encountering to actually um, yeah, cross that uh, and, and link that with this um, poetic persona. And um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Marianne. One more question, um, which is um, from Alex B. And he mentions you spoke about the generative potency of the fold. Where did the conceptualization most surprisingly open a new approach for uh, Fontane, I think, the project you introduced? And yeah, so um, the um, in, in the Fontana project, I think there uh, there were um, two um, instances um, 
at least, and, and uh, Margiana and Victoria could maybe add to that. Uh, I think they're also around. But um, first is um, that um, we already had um, uh, several, I mean, it's actually in, in visualization, we have uh, done lots of kind of scalable and kind of zoomable techniques, but here we really wanted to uh, design um, unique uh, um, representations at these different levels. So, um, and, and, um, and so, um, Basically, that was very useful to actually think through the fault uh, in terms of actually designing the transitions and the in between steps. And the uh, surprise that I think is also surprising when you when you use it is actually when you switch into this dark mode uh, where the kind of complication happens. Um, I mean, for us, many of this was surprising because we were not so familiar with Fontana's own reading habits. But actually seeing that uh, he read certain authors uh, uh, similarly than others. Um, I think there were a few surprises there, but I can actually um, mention now one from the top of my head, but um, please try it out. Great, thanks so much, Marianne. Um, looking at the time, um, I have to wrap up the discussion at this point. I want to just remind you there will be the option to, for example, continue some of these discussions later on, either by getting in touch, uh, visiting Marianne's website, which would be mariannedirk.de, or um, also joining maybe Gather Town later on. Uh, thanks again, Marian, for this wonderful opening talk. And with this, I'm handing over to the provocations track and Eric Alexander will introduce you to the speakers. There. Thank you very much. Thanks, Florian. Excellent. Uh, so for the next piece of this first session of the VISPR DH workshop, uh, we have our first of two provocation sessions. Now, this was something new that we were trying this year. Um, and the uh, authors of these provocations were prompted with the following question. What is the most undervalued or misunderstood issue surrounding the use of the term data in visualization and digital humanities collaborations? Uh, they were asked to submit 200 word provocations uh, along with optional counter perspectives to go with them. Um, and our format here is going to consist of, uh, for each session, three back to back to back lightning talks, uh, followed by a general conversation uh, between the provocation authors in the form of a panel. Um, please, uh, as these uh, authors talk about uh, their provocations, uh, post questions over uh, Discord and YouTube, um, and those will then be filtered into the panel discussion uh, once we're all together. Um, our three talks for this morning are going to be uh, first, uh, Ground Truths for the Humanities from Yvette Orquin, Hein Vandenberg, and Ariana Betti. Uh, that's going to be followed by the necessity of re and rethinking, redefining, and reimagining data from Chris Weaver. Uh, and finally, data as material versus data as reason from Paul Heinecker. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Yvette for our first talk. Hi, yes, let me share my screen. Okay, our statement is that ensuring a faithful interaction with data and its representation for humanities can and should depend on expert constructed ground truths. We know that comparison to a ground truth is key to be sure we are representing data faithfully. Now in the humanities, according to some, ground truths are as good as impossible. And true, humanities is concerned with interpretation, ambiguity and argumentation. And it is also true that we find in the humanities multiple valid definitions of concepts. 
But we say science is no different. First, there exist different, different definitions of concept in the sciences as well. And second, concepts, whether scientific or scholarly, are always interpretations. We say that ground truths for humanities data are not only possible, they are essential. In particular, they are essential to computational evaluation. And in fact, all evaluation must be based on expert specialized knowledge, knowledge that matches the level of complexity of the computational application. This is already known that on specialized data, generic types of benchmarking fail to guarantee reliable results. And the point we add is this, wherever expert knowledge is available, specialized ground truths can be constructed for any concept in any field of knowledge. Our group has developed a method for constructing ground truths in any domain, working with text that is rich in concepts. And the method relies on an approach we developed called the model approach to the history of ideas to fix the interpretation of a concept where concepts are then represented as complex networked relations between terms. And these complexes of terms we call models of concepts. Um, our interpretive models of concepts can then be rather naturally turned into schemes for annotating textual fragments in a corpus. The results of the annotations is a ground truth for that concept and that specific corpus. And annotations can then be used to test whether the output of computational analysis matches the best supported interpretation of fragments as captured in a model in our sense. We submit that this method can increase the objectivity and replicability of humanities research. And domains in humanities which do not focus on concepts should develop similar methods for constructing ground truths. Thank you. I won't be sharing. I'll just be reading. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, the theme of this year's Viz for DH is rethinking, redefining, and reimagining data. And I'd like to propose an argument for the necessity of the re um, in each one of those. So the epistemological, technological, and social forces that precipitate representational finalities in both visualization and the digital humanities, I think can and should be countered with shared ideological and methodological counterbalances that nurture representational evolution. In other words, we should strive not to have data and our visual representations converge on results so much as be um, open-ended and intentionally so. So data is a tool, right? It's a means to knowledge. Too often it is treated as a treasure though, an end in itself. And the digital humanities uh, high quality repository is often a, a cornerstone of careers and reputations. Um, in visualization, of course, similarly clean and complete data is often a computational prerequisite for us to successfully develop techniques um, and to have those be adopted as applications. And there are similar extrinsic forces at work on our desire to produce products and develop our careers and our reputations as well. As a treasure or not, data is certainly as expensive as we've, we all experience, I'm sure. Um, it is expensive to structure, to populate, to modify, manage, share, and to explain. Um, ironically, it can even be expensive to destroy. Um, the better the data, the more it proclaims productivity, but there's also um, um, some consideration here of the sunk costs and considerations of straying from a straight and narrow path um, towards some final clean um, or complete um, data set. Um, and moreover, expending the time and effort to examine the implications of our representational choices and explore alternatives is seen as important, but often as lower value than many of the other things that we're focusing on, at least at this point in the evolution of this for DH. So how can we counterbalance these forces um, of data finality? Um, I think this calls for an ideological commitment to a more circumspect methodology as we progress forward. Visualization and digital humanities are methodological fields at their core after all, 
to continue developing new cap capabilities for others. Um, we must work together to conceive of representations, both data representations and visual representations as the things that we dissect and involve, evolve and seek to understand rather than to merely sculpt and polish um, for placement on pedestals, which is still um, a big part of the motivation um, and uh, the mechanisms of what we do. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Paul and let me quickly share my screen. All right, here it is. So um, I'm going to present a provocation which came out of my PhD research called um, Data as Material versus Data as Reason. Um, in an interview in 2010, German media artist Joachim Sauter was asked how generative design approaches relate to the artistic method of painting. The interviewer asked if he could compare the color pigments applied in painting to the process data seen as material. Sauter denied and suggested instead that data should be rather seen as the motive. His distinction got me thinking about what about what I think is a fundamental conceptual flaw when working with data. Data is the new oil or data flooding are just two rhet rhetorical landmarks of naturalizing the inconceivable stream of big data. The hope is that the abundance of data forms a pile of potential knowledge, which is, for example, disclosed by data visualizations, so-called pattern recognition. This approach follows a mainly technologically informed perspective on data. Data then becomes the given and the naturally present material. To extract data, to mine data, to clean data are rhetorics that disguise data processing as an end in itself. This, especially in the age context, dominant form of data centrism describes a certain productivity centered approach towards working with data as a means to an end. By denying or at least excluding the presence of the human subjectivity, it tries to create some sort of possibility. The dependency on data is becoming increasingly prevalent so that methods like DataVis even search for and create patterns where actually are none, so-called pattern risk recognition. Data centrism needs images at all costs. Good, quote unquote, the age research comes with visible results. There is no culture to opt out, unfolding the idea that no image is sometimes better than, is sometimes better than any image. The conceptual counter perspective of data as reason would then acknowledge the artificial aspects of data and closes the view to questions about the social, political, and material consequences. Data can also be read as a motive, which allows to ask for hidden intentions, beliefs, and ideas behind its formation, its models. Since da data is always embedded in social cultural contexts, narratives, and interpretation patterns, any data visualization is first of all a visualization of these models and only secondarily a visualization of the data itself. Following this conception would allow for new interpretations approaches within the humanities. So to wrap up, instead of assuming that data is the answer, we should rather ask to what question was data the answer in the first place.
Excellent. Thank you very much to to all of those speakers for for presenting this, especially in this new format. Um, we will have some questions coming in uh, potentially externally, but um, I think we can perhaps get started ourselves. Um, so, uh, Chris and Yvette, I think that the two of your provocations uh, play well off of one another in that uh, I'm curious of whether or not it is sort of possible to reconcile the need for these ground truths in humanities. Um, with the added cost and, and challenge of constantly revisiting them and revising these sort of data sets? Are those two things things that can work together? Well, I think they're quite complementary, um, actually, even though I'm calling for not having a finality to our data and visual representations, um, they should still support, um, at the very least, punctuation. Um, so that there are um, convergences at any given point in time to um, 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 particular conclusions, particular um, arguments, and so on. And those should be maintained. Um, so ev although everything can be revisited over time, that doesn't mean that uh, anything necessarily um, has to be lost. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think the point we tried to make as well with saying that science is no different is also in science, you use well, your best current theory to work with. You need something workable, but um, that doesn't mean it's final. I think one of the, the big challenges will be to figure out how to capture the, um, I would say more interpretive element um, on the humanity side. Uh, I agree with, with uh, that, that um, um, interpretation happens um, in science as well, right? Um, through, say, hypothesis formation um, um, and so on. Um, um, but how can we can capture the interpretation and the interpretation process um, in both our data and visual representations and maintain those over time? Excellent. Um, so, Paul, to shift to some of the conversation over to you, we have a, a question um, coming from Huda Lampadam uh, from Discord asking, uh, how do we practice viewing data as reason uh, through different methodologies, vocabulary, uh, potentially arguing for different expectations within the DH community? Um, very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I guess for me, who is some practitioner himself and who lately got into reflecting and theorizing is actually acknowledging that this particular idea of data visualization that we are practicing right now is just one historical moment in the history of uh, visualization, so to say, and the idea of reflecting and um, criticizing uh, concepts why imagery is actually older than we think. So my particular research is actually not maybe so much about like looking for new methods, actually looking back at history and looking what artists have done, what humanity in general did to actually um, ex craft the experience of the world around them. So for me, it's actually isolating this very particular idea of uh, data visualization, which is, as I try to describe, very technology optimization efficiency driven and get back maybe to more qualitative approaches and um, Personally, for me, this is this is a really uh, big resource of, of knowledge. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great thought, and um, I, I agree with it very strongly. Um, as someone coming from the visualization and computational, even vis systems side of things, I see those mechanical concerns um, and being addressed uh, much more so than the the, the top down. Um, concerns of, of how do we um, um, express ourselves um, in data, including our reasoning processes, um, the observations that we do, the conversations that we have, and even the provenance about um, um, how we've gone about doing those things. So, so can we develop data representations and their um, um, corresponding interfaces, um, including visualizations and otherwise, that let us perform those expressions? And can we have the um, um, the, the data structures, so to speak, right, it's writ large, um, that can somehow capture those things in a way that we can understand and, and share and, and revisit. Thank you, Chris. Um, maybe just another thought I just um, realized. Um, 
it's also the notions that we have, right? When we think about those images, we were constantly now talking about like um, data representations. So it's just uh, one particular uh, thing I'm researching at the moment that the very notion of representation is also a, let's say criticized one because it's like leading to imagery that is maybe a little more passive, right? It's like imagery that tries to describe depictions. Like we get an image of an object. We um, have a data visualization which describes uh, data of this particular idea, but rather I try, or I'm re really interested in, in notions of imagery, which really try to um, formulate this very active um, performative aspect of imagery. So nothing that is actually passively just depicting things, but rather actually creates um, this very notion of this object we are actually, um, that we're actually facing. So one one particular um, notion that I really like is actually what you already discussed. It's, it's like the model, right? The model is nothing that um, gets depicted, something that is created, that is actively um, shaping the, the notions that you have. And I don't know, I would like to ask if you if you would agree or why do you, why do, what is your hope for the notion of representation maybe? Uh, my, my hope that we is that we can move beyond thinking of, of data as just data that is some sort of reduction of the 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 somehow the, the, the factual point elements um, of our our thought and um, sharing processes, um, but rather that we can somehow um, and model and represent. Um, and, and by the way, I think of models and representations as almost the same thing these days. Um, but can can we somehow capture that? Um, um, all of the, the qualitative texture of our individual and collective um, thought processes, right? And of course, that that for computational sake, we have to somehow reduce those those to data models. And I th I think that's the uh, the big challenge for us to not only do that say say once, but to do that as our own reasoning processes uh, evolve, our understanding of that as well. So there, there's kind of like open endedness on multiple levels um, that um, we somehow need to address if we're going to move forward beyond just having data and visualizations be these um, basically these these output expressions for purposes of presentation. Excellent. There's a uh, an additional sort of question coming in from Discord that I think is is voiced uh, to to everyone here and could easily be answered for everyone here, but I think is particularly relevant to Yvette, Mariana, and Hein, um, which is if we allow augmentation and extension of data, which is good, do we need to worry about pollution of data and fake data and how we handle that? Who is the arbiter and how are boundaries created, set, and enforced? I guess we'll jump in um, again here. That that is that is such a big question. If you can somehow make um, your modeling and representation of data be somehow this large, shared, um, open-ended thing, it's it's rife with possibilities for manipulation and ab abuse, including things like fake data. Um, so the, somehow there need to be um, um, social constructs, um, either um, through a global recognition of practices. And I suspect that many areas of the humanities also have uh, already have such practices. Um, um, but also for any, you know, given local um, data structure, some representation, um, it would be somehow managed um, socially by by a community. So so we, we need those social structures to, to manage that as well. I don't think that's any different from um, the, the the less mechanical um, policies and, and and practices that we somehow socially um, um, manage in the various ways that we do. Yeah, Ariana. So um, I'd say that depends very much. I mean, probably what Chris just said also presupposes an idea where the data is available. I don't know, Twitter data or this type of, of information that can be polluted in, in, in ways in which, uh, you know, control would be indeed a problem shifted to organizations or social structures or, or, or things that are not easy for individuals or uh, organizations to, to control. 
in a very easy way. Um, of course, that depends. I mean, the type of data we work with, you know, books or collection of books or, or, or text of a certain type um, are far less, uh, you know, easy to pollute in that sense. And, but the question is still relevant because um, it opens up the question of uh, data ethics in, in, in a certain ways. Um, I mean, who is the owner of the data? Uh, who puts it at disposal? Who controls it? And the responsibility that goes uh, together with uh, given a data set that goes from ethically relevant to you know simply doing your, your job or, or offering data in a form that is uh, acceptable, shareable uh, in the right way. I think there's there's potential here to um, kind of get the the best of both worlds, both um, 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 or organizational um, structuring, management, um, policy making, um, but also um, in the ability to contribute at an individual level and and everywhere in between. Uh, so again, speaking as a computer scientist, I think in terms of say access control that you might um, apply to. Um, the different columns in your data set. And it may well be that some of those columns are simply um, static and publicly available. They were the original source data, however you define original. Um, other columns of that data are somehow have um, um, policies and procedures imposed upon them by an organization of various levels. Um, and other columns are the interpretations of given individuals for their private purposes or for small groups. Um, so I think you can get a mix of both kind of like authoritative kind of data interpretation and open-ended data creation, um, but also um, on private individual purposes and, and, and everywhere in between. I, th I think there's the potential for developing both the structures and our mechanisms that support that entire range of, of social levels in what we do. Given the sort of different uh, perspectives that, that come in from the variety of communities that come together for this sort of intersection of this for DH, um, for again, for all of you, what do you see as the some of the best forums for communication about uh, how we can be coming up with these sort of um, uh, procedures, ethical and otherwise, um, in this cross section? I just like to put in a brief plug for future viz for dh workshops. It might have been a little bit of a <laughs> circular opportunity to, to point back. Well, this is, so you know. There are definitely bodies that go over this at different levels of even governmental level or uh, at levels of reflection in, in academic circles about data ethics in uh, the philosophy of artificial intelligence, for instance, that's, that's, that's one way. So I, I guess the first um, thing that comes to me would be indeed conferences, dedicated conferences, um, and, but also governmental uh, briefs and, and, and you know, white papers and this kind of things. I mean, there's a lot going on in fact. So the question is how do we communicate with, or how do we, um, you know, make sure that also for us, I mean, this community that we are now um, talking to, uh, you know, there is the right access to it and we are reading the right things and, and talking to the right people. Maybe just a small remark. So, of course, there's this whole body or like discipline of critical data studies. Um, which is a really rich um, research strand and there's a lot of things going on, especially in the last years. What I just found really particularly interesting in my research is that if you're looking at particular research disciplines that have already worked with data for so long, given maybe like a discipline of psychology who um, had a long um, discussion within themselves, what they actually expect as um, empir empirical sciences and so on. There's a rich body of actually like criticizing data in those disciplines in itself. And it's actually surprising that one of the few disciplines that lack maybe this kind of critical discourse is maybe, yeah, 
actually saying uh, digital humanities. So my, my advice maybe would be going to those disciplines who are, have always worked with data and see what they are doing and it's super interesting. Excellent. Well, with that, I think we are uh, just about out of time here. Um, so thank you all so much for participating uh, in this panel. Um, please, um, those of you with emojis to do so, please uh, give them a virtual round of applause. Um, we will be bringing things back together for Viz for DH uh, in about 25 minutes. Um, remember that there is uh, a gather town opportunity to continue these conversations. Uh, in the coffee break and throughout the day. Um, and I encourage those of you uh, who are, are engaged in here to uh, take advantage of that as well as Discord. Um, and thank you all so much. DVR has always been from considerable interest to the scientific community. To this day, traditional desktop setups are the gold standard. However, what if we could utilize DVR in virtual reality? Now you think, VR and DVR are so computationally expensive, how is this even feasible? Come to my talk and we present you a straightforward solution to visualize volumetric datasets with high refresh rates on VR devices. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. Hello. Student competition is intrinsic to the pedagogy of cybersecurity education. At RIT, we have observed that the collegiate penetration testing competition and other related competitions are missing a key element, visualization. In this position paper, we provide an architecture and plan to create compelling experiences for participants and spectators. In doing so, we can potentially attract new talent into the field. Serum graphs are variant of stack graphs with curve baseline, and the main factor affecting its readability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The results show that our algorithms perform better than the others. are dynamic graphs model changing relationships between entities over time. In this work, we present multi-scale snapshots, a vision analytics approach to provide an overview of a dynamic graph at multiple temporal scales. The approach consists of three steps, creating multi-scale temporal summaries, applying graph embeddings, and the semi-automatic visual analysis. The combination of these steps lets us visually explore how temporal and structural properties affect the overall dynamic graph. Ray tracing techniques can create images of astonishing realism and beauty. In the last years, the performance of those techniques has been increased significantly using dedicated hardware. Who thought that it's also possible to accelerate this? We show how to dramatically accelerate force-directed graph drawing with RT cores, yielding a speed up of 4 to 13x. If you want to know more, please see our talk. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought.
In this study, we designed a system named Coastal Explorer to facilitate the causal analysis. Users can explore the causal graph to perceive the causality and it is uncertainty, validate the causality with the raw data, and apply the confirmed causality to what-if analysis. CMED is a visual analytics framework for exploring medical image data annotations acquired from crowdsourcing. CMED can be used to visualize, classify, and filter crowdsourced clinical data based on a number of different metrics such as detection rate, logged events, and clustering of the annotations. CMED provides several interactive linked visualization components to analyze the crowd annotation results for a particular video and the associated workers. Visualizing streaming of big data may be difficult if the visual idiom gets cluttered. Although some techniques solve this issue by aggregating data into different idioms, each representing a different period, they still lack transitions to help people understand how data points get from one visual idiom to another. To solve this issue, we proposed several transitions between several pairs of visualizations. We tested them through a user study where participants watched a video per transition and had to answer seven questions. We present NL4DV, a toolkit that helps prototype natural language interfaces for data visualizations. NL4DV provides a high-level Python API for interpreting natural language queries. The API automates the core tasks of processing natural language queries to infer relevant information and determine appropriate visualizations, allowing visualization developers to focus more on designing and implementing the user interface. The daily work of criminalists consists of analyzing relationships in complex data while proposing and verifying multiple hypotheses, often under heavy pressure. This poses high demands on their memory and cognitive capacity. We present Visaland, a tool that helps investigators track their visual exploration and reasoning. It organizes analytical states in a graph structure which can be revisited and shared with colleagues. We present TransPhys, a design study that is proposed to analyze and integrate close and distant reading of multiple translations. TransPhys presents the overview of the collection to capture global patterns that is facilitated by the ADM web matrix. TransPhys integrates a detailed view to explore interesting path of alignments. We also propose the TLC view to examine and explore the terms of the user selected path to justify and reason the AD analysis. Hurricanes, air pollution, forest fires, urban sprawl, ocean plastics, politics, traffic jams, and pandemics. So many of our modern challenges are geospatial and so much of our big data is geospatial. How is the Viz community addressing needs to visualize and analyze this data? Our review examines IEEE Viz's recent contributions to geovisualization and geospatial analysis. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. In this paper, we investigate design choices for work or flat maps by domain experts. We tackle two research questions, how do domain tasks influence the design choices, and what equal error projection is preferred. Through a survey, we collected 40 curvelet maps designed by 20 social scientists, and our analysis suggests that the choices vary across tasks, the projection was most important, and the equal error projection was preferred.
In a visualization, laying out labels to data points needs to be done automatically with a fast labeling algorithm. We introduce occupancy bitmap. It's a data structure that helps the labeling algorithm to first quickly record the positions of existing marks and labels, and second, quickly detect overlapping of labels to the recorded positions. Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduced a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. We demonstrate that people can use the special cues available in virtual reality to help them effectively remember and recall scholarly articles. We used a virtual coffee shop and asked participants to remember four abstracts from scientific publications. And we termed this method a virtual reality memory palace variante. The success of a cultural neural network has been attracting many students and practitioners to learn the exciting technology. However, for beginners, the CN model is not easy to understand. We introduced the explainer, an interactive realization tool to help beginners more easily learn about conventional neural network. Using the explainer, users can progressively explore the CN model with real-life images in their browser, getting a comprehensive understanding of both high-level model structure and the low-level underlying mathematical operations. Magazine-style narrative visualizations can be challenging due to the need to go back and forth from the text to the visualization. We use eye tracking to monitor which sentence is currently being read and trigger visual links between that sentence and the corresponding data points in the visualization. Results show that the gaze-driven links increase comprehension of the documents without hindering reading time. In this presentation, we introduce a provenance library, TRAC, which makes implementing provenance in web-based tools easy. TRAC introduces a novel storage model for web-based provenance tracking and has an associated history visualization, which can be fully customized. TRAC also contains multiple ways to save and share individual states or entire sessions of an application and ensures that export data is easy to analyze in interesting and unique ways. We propose X-Matrix, a novel method for random forest interpretability. From a random forest model, a logic rule is extracted from each decision path on every decision tree. Once the complete set of logic rules is obtained, visual representations can be built for global and local explanations. X-Matrix, making random forests interpretable. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. How many times have you asked yourself, why should I stay in academia? Junior researchers might ask this more often, but it's a popular topic among all levels of academic seniority. Our six panelists will discuss with you the controversial topic of pursuing an academic path in visualization, targeting an open discussion on the choice of staying or leaving, and keeping the specifics of our community in mind. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. 
However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper. If machine learning were like education, we would like to test what concepts our student, the model, has learned. Does it learn the concept of object rotation? Does additional text help with object recognition? We need a methodology and platform for conducting such tests. In this paper, we present a novel visual analytics tool that enables hypothesis-based evaluation of machine learned models. Transport dynamics in unsteady flow can be visualized by the finite time lap on a fixed point. But what happens if the flow contains random Gaussian deviations? We introduce a recently published quantity that is similar to the FDLE but considers these stochastic deviations. We discuss the application to real-world data, compare it to prior methods and present a complementary visualization. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. We propose a new semi-automatic method that uses topological features to guide users in tracing neurons and integrate this method within a virtual reality framework. We use the Mohr smell complex to find a set of candidate neuron arcs. The candidate arcs are integrated into a VR neuron tracing system and expose through a Mohr smell complex guided semi-automatic tracing tool. The topological ridge graph underlying our MSC guided tool is robust against gaps in the signal. All of these distribution samples refer to the test samples not well covered by the training data, like these black cats. They are misclassified with high confidence due to their black bodies. To explain why these samples are out of distribution, we developed OD Analyzer, a visual analytics tool which provides an ensemble detection method and a grid-based visualization to detect and analyze out of distribution samples. After determining the departure timestamp, the experts then moved to verify the recommended shuttle stops and routes. Note that Shuttlefish recommends a default shuttle stops and routes based on the metric of average distance. Then they observed that in R cluster 4, the system recommends Heijian Genyuan as the shuttle bus stop, but the experts identified that another drop off spot Pan Shanhuayuan is located in the middle part in this regional cluster. Transitions are widely used in the WDU's 